Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Kaliznik. I'm a senior manager in BC's Trade Policy and Negotiations Branch, the Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for a webinar on doing business in Japan under the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP. Before I go any further, I want to respectfully acknowledge that I'm conducting this webinar from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. Following some welcoming remarks, we have a few speakers who will cover a variety of topics related to Japan and the CPTPP. Uh, I want to mention that the session is being recorded today and will be shared with registrants in a follow-up email along with the presentations that you see today, along with some other hopefully useful resources. If you experience any technical issues of any kind, please send a message using the chat function to myself uh, or to my colleague, Ghana Draws. Uh, and finally, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to pose any questions for speakers. You can pose these at any time throughout the event. And of course, there will be, hopefully will be some time at the end of the event for some, some questions. Please be as specific as you can and indicate where possible who you are directing your question to. Uh, now I would like to welcome our first guest, the Honorable George Chow is BC's Minister of State for Trade. Uh, we have been fortunate to have him participate in all of our CPTPP webinars to date, as well as some other information sessions focused on other FTAs. So thank you, Minister, for joining us today. Uh, I will now turn things over to you. Well, thank you, Ben, and good evening to all of you who are in British Columbia, and good morning to those of you in Japan. And as Ben said, my name is George Chow. I'm the Minister of State for Trade for British Columbia. I'm pleased to join you from Vancouver on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples with whom we share this land and their hospitality. Today, I'm here to bring greetings on behalf of our Premier, John Horgan, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Thank you also to the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, Global Affairs Canada, and Export Development Canada for partnering with the government of British Columbia uh, on this great event and joining us here today as well. And it's great to see some familiar and new faces. And I'd like to talk a bit about trade diversification. So our immediate economic priority have been outlined in our economic plan called Stronger BC. This plan will make life more affordable train for the jobs of tomorrow, tackle climate change, and position BC for success in the global economy. Well, BC is a small open economy, and we're at the intersection of North America and Asia trade routes. So BC's economic success relies on strong and resilient trading relationship with key partners, whether it's the pandemic, the impact of climate change, the current supply chain challenges, the war in the Ukraine, or trade protectionism across the globe. Working closely with long-standing and trading partners like Japan, it's key to BC's long-term economic success. My mandate as the Minister of State for Trade includes developing and implementing a new trade diversification strategy. The strategy will allow businesses to connect with more international partners, creating more jobs in BC, and helping to protect BC's trade network from supply chain disruption, market instability, and geographically specific trends and changes. Free trade agreement information session like today's webinar are just one small piece of what BC is doing to support a diversification of what we are trading and with whom we are trading with. So I've been pleased to be able to speak at other information sessions focused on opportunity for BC businesses in Vietnam, Singapore, and Malaysia under the CPTPP, or Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. BC's geographic location and strong business and cultural ties across the Pacific position us to benefit from increased trade between Canadian and Pacific Rim markets. Japan is the world's third largest economy 
with a significant consumer market. And it's BC's third largest export de destination with goods export totaling $4.7 billion in 2021. The CPTPP offers opportunity for BC businesses across many sectors to enter Japan or to expand our presence in Japan. The CPTPP also presents us with a chance to become better integrated with Japan, which is a key, key participant in global value chains. BC exports of mining and forest products, as well as some agri-food agri already founding success in Japan. The CPTPP makes species provider of goods and services more competitive than providers from countries that do not have a free trade agreement with Japan. Better market access for goods and services and rules for fair and transparent trade and investment are just a few of the benefits. Leveraging these benefits can help create good paying jobs for indigenous people, women, and other groups that have been overly affected by the pandemic and traditionally underrepresented it in exporting. So our provincial trade and investment network stretches from BC to Asia, Europe, and the United States. Throughout the pandemic, our trade and investment teams have continued to develop opportunity, facilitate virtual business to business meeting, like today, for example, and stay connected to key contacts in all markets. These trade and investment offices provide a range of services for exporters. They are engaged with existing and potential customers, provide market intelligence, and represent BC's export goods at meetings and events. Their job is to accelerate opportunity for BC exporters. BC serves Japan related businesses inquiry through the BC Trade and Investment Representative in Tokyo, and you're meeting them today online. And they work closely with our federal counterparts through the Trade Commissioner Service. Reps from our provincial trade teams are also here today online. And I encourage all of you to connect with them to discuss the opportunity created by this new agreement. This will ensure you understand the market opportunity created by the CPTPP. So in conclusion, whenever you may be in your export journey, I hope that you will consider Japan in your trade plans. And I hope today's webinar will provide the information and inspiration you need to start exploring the opportunity that CPP uh, have to offer. My ministry staff offer many information sessions on how Canada's trade agreement can benefit your business, your workers, your community, and the investors. Please keep your eyes out for upcoming sessions similar to this one. It is a pleasure to be here virtually with you and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Minister, for those welcoming remarks. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Okay, next I'd like to welcome Lisa Mallon. Lisa is the first secretary, trade policy, CPTPP, the Embassy of Canada in Japan. Uh, we're going to bring Lisa's presentation up right away. Lisa has been a wealth of knowledge for me in, in preparation for this webinar, as well as some of the other resources, uh, sorry, resource materials that uh, will be shared with you later. Um, she's here to talk about the Japanese market and the CPTPP. So Lisa, I think your presentation is almost ready. So I will uh, turn things over to you. Well, thank you so much, Ben. Thank you so much to the government of British Columbia for organizing this wonderful webinar. Um, I am delighted to be joining all of you today from our embassy in Tokyo. It's a, it's a cloudy Wednesday morning over here. Um, and my presentation basically will help situate, you know, why do we see Japan as a vital trade and investment partner? Um, for Canada, but especially for British Columbia, as the minister so eloquently uh, talked about the importance of Japan, it's key for regional supply chains um, in, and, uh, and, a, and a, such a big market for British Columbia. So, all right, let's start with the stats. Okay, look here, these are some really, I think these are quite striking. So as the minister mentioned, Japan is the world's third largest economy. It has a GDP of $6.2 trillion. 
It has a, a mature uh, premium market. It's a population of 125 million. In 2021, last year, Japan was Canada's fourth largest merchandise trading partner. Um, even throughout the pandemic, Japan has been a really key market for Canada. Um, if we look at 2020, when global trade was, you know, a little bit unpredictable, Japan continued to be a steady market for Canada. 2021, we saw a huge recovery, actually. We were up 17% in 2021 over 2020. And then if we look at even more recent figures, we've seen a remarkable an exceptional start to 2022. Uh, between January and March this year, exports from Canada to Japan were up 30%, actually, when compared to the same period uh, in 2021. So I think this kind of helps highlight why Japan uh, is an important and valuable part, um, market for Canada in our post-pandemic economic recovery and our efforts to diversify trade. Um, let's turn to the next slide. So why does Japan matter? Well, we have significant and growing bilateral ties. Uh, what might not be as obvious when you look at the statistics, but the fact is Canada and Japan share common values and interests, such as supporting the rules-based international order, democracy, and human rights. Given these uncertain and unpredictable times, it's even more important to know that we share these fundamental values, especially when you're thinking about doing business in each other's markets. Canada and Japan are important partners in security, trade, and global economic recovery, and we co cooperate really closely in the region and in the world, including in the G7, the G20, the World Trade Organization, APEC, and more. And next year, Japan will be hosting the G7, so please stay tuned for more on our deepening bilateral relationship. I think there'll be lots of interesting things happening on the ground here in Japan. And one of the major developments, I think, in our overall relationship recently is the growing understanding in Japan about how Canada can play a key role in supporting Japan's food and energy security needs. Uh, if we look back just a couple of years ago, uh, Canada wasn't exporting LPT, LPG to Japan, but now we have, I believe, about 10% of the market share. We went from maybe shipping a couple hundred million dollars to last year in 2021, we shipped about a billion dollars of LPG from Canada to Japan. So that's just one uh, uh, measure there of how we can support Japan's energy security needs. Um, we have here, so Canada and Japan are the two largest uh, economies in the CPTPP. Where does Canada sit in terms of Japan's trading partners? Uh, we're 15th in terms of Japan's largest trading partner. But if you look at Japan's trading partners outside of Asia and Oceania, Canada is Japan's third largest trading partner, and we're trailing only behind the US and Germany, ranking ahead of other major economies such as the UK, France, and India. And furthermore, thanks to the CPTPP, you know, our trading and commercial relationship is poised to grow in the years ahead as we take advantage of these new opportunities created. Trends in Japanese investment to Canada. Japan is Canada's largest investor from Asia, has an estimated $46 billion in invested in Canada as of last year. We're seeing some really exciting trends taking place that are driven by our two countries' commitment to net zero by 2050 and by the continuing growth of tech and digital. The importance of meeting our net zero goals and advancing EX or energy, energy transition is dr driving renewed interest in Canada from blue ammonia to green hydrogen, tidal power and lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles. Japan Inc. is noticing Canada's strengths and capabilities, and we're contributing to these efforts in Canada through collaboration, investment, and partnerships. Um, for example, last year, Mitsubishi Corporation announced uh, it's considering producing blue ammonia in Alberta. And in March this year, Honda Canada announced that it will invest $1.38 billion in its Canadian facility to produce next generation hydrogen electric, hybrid electric vehicles. So these are some of the opportunities that Japanese companies see in Canada to respond to the needs to address climate change. Uh, we also see that Japanese companies are interested in Canada's tech and startup scene. This is really exciting. Uh, for example, last year, SoftBank's Vision 2 fund uh, made investments in at least six Canadian tech companies. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So just look at um, 
Japan and CPTPP market opportunities. So we've established Japan as a really important market. Uh, it's highly developed, it's stable, it has its premium, you know, has a very high per capita income. If anyone has had the pleasure to travel to Japan, you've noticed Japan has a large middle class um, and uh, there's lots of opportunities here. So interestingly, Japan has a large middle class and one of the oldest populations in the world, um, you know, about a population about the size of Canada that are 65 and older, but it also means that there's opportunities here. Uh, for example, for, you know, there's demand for senior friendly products, the things that are easy to open, for example, or easy to prepare and eat smaller portions at reasonable prices. Uh, so yes, there, there's some interesting trends. Um, and again, lots of opportunities grow thanks to the CPTPP. So in a nutshell, how does the CPTPP help Canadian exporters? So number one, very ambitious tariff elimination. Number two, liberalized services and investments. We have three, I would say labor mobility has been improved. Four, simplified customs procedures. Five, and there's access to public procurement. So those are kind of, in a nutshell, some of the key themes and, and, um, and areas that benefit from the CPTPP. Uh, in terms of export trends to Canada, Japan, we've seen growth, uh, particularly in sectors where there's large tariff reductions. So, we have a competitive advantage, as the minister said. We can switch to the next slide. Um, I have the opportunity to go to Osaka recently, and Japan is hosting the Expo in 2025. Canada has announced that we'll be hosting a pavilion there. It's an opportunity to showcase Canada. You might be wondering, why is there a picture of the Osaka castle here? Well, I spoke to people at the Osaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry and people responsible for Osaka City. They're thinking outside of the box. They want to help showcase Canadian technology and talent and they're, they're open to ideas. For example, they said that if let's say a Canadian company wanted to come and do you know, projections or they wanted to showcase their products in front of the Osaka Castle, that's something that they might be open to. So there's some fun things to think about in the years ahead, you know, in the lead up to the Osaka 2025 Expo. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please. In terms of market challenges, as you can imagine, for all the reasons why we think Japan is a wonderful partner, other countries think the same thing. And so do our competitors. So Japan does have FTAs with other countries. You know, fellow CPTPP members are there, Australia, New Zealand, they're on the ground as well. There's some high expectations to taste, for example, freshness, appearance, packaging. It's a very complex and demanding market. There might be a bit of a language gap. Um, there might be some multiple layers for importers and distributors, but don't fret. If we go to the next page, please, the next slide. Uh, we're here to help you. So the Trade Commissioner Service, I think we've been referred to as Canada's best kept secret. We have over 125 years, I believe, of experience. And we have 50 people in our networks, um, all the way from Northern Japan and Hokkaido to Fukuoka and Southern Japan. We work really closely with our wonderful BC uh, office colleagues here. There's a number of other provinces represented as well, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and Quebec. And we work hand in hand with our offices to give you the best market intelligence to work through some of the sticky challenges that you might have. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're here to help you. Um, next slide, please. And in terms of tools and resources, this is all free for all Canadian companies who are interested in exploring different markets, especially including Japan. Um, there's, we have instructional videos, you know, um, there's information that you can, you can access. It's all at your fingertips, it's all online. Uh, we are delighted to support Canadian companies and uh, give you as much help as you need to figure out if this is the right market for you. And if it is, you know, please, please give us a call. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about Japan. We are delighted to be joining you today with our wonderful colleagues from the government of British Columbia. Thank you, merci and arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much, Lisa. That's certainly a compelling case for why our attendees might want to uh, consider Japan as a possible export market. Uh, Lisa will remain throughout, I believe. So uh, please direct uh, any questions you may have to her in the Q&A. 
Next, I want to introduce Eric Peterson, who is a trade commissioner with Global Affairs Canada. Uh, Eric is based in Vancouver, so he's here to tell you all about Global Affairs Canada's Pacific Regional Office. So the virtual uh, thanks, floor ben. is yours, Eric. I, thank you. Uh, good, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, glad to see you and or see you again if uh, if you've been joining from another webinar. Um, I'm Eric Peterson. I am a trade commissioner here in the Pacific Regional Office of the Trade Commissioner Service, and so that means I I'm kind of like uh, Lisa, but uh, my specialty is is to support businesses here in in the Pacific region to become. Uh, ready to export, prepared to export. I'm basically you can consider me as your your free of charge uh, international business development consultant uh, because I, I help uh, uh, clients in the region become ready to get to market. We do preparation for markets. We we can talk about strategy. We can talk about the the best places we would uh, suggest you would go. We can do give market intelligence. We can can uh, give information about different funding programs, including Can Export SME or Can Export Innovation. Uh, and then once uh, we've decided the best route to help you get to market, um, we go hand in hand with our offices abroad. Just just like Lisa, we have uh, offices in about 160 different places around the world. And so from from their perspective, it's it's talking about maybe trade policy issues if it's a CPTPP thing, or we can talk about um, uh, qualified contacts, making sure that that you are meeting the people you need to, to meet for the, the success of your business. We can do troubleshooting. We talk about sanctions and export controls, uh, which is in, increasingly important given geopolitical circumstances these days. Uh, and uh, many of us have experience in places like Japan. Uh, I was posted in Japan about 10 years ago. And so I would be very happy to hear from you if you have any questions, if there's anything I can do to support you here uh, in the region so that I can help you get to market overseas. Um, I will leave my email address in the chat. We can uh, continue it later or, or you can put a question in the chat. Uh, just very glad to support you and uh, glad to be part of this call. So uh, thank you, Ben, back to you. All right, thank you, Eric. Hopefully our attendees will reach out the next time they need assistance and use that um, free international business development expertise or however, I can't remember how you put it, but uh, that's uh, certainly a, also very compelling. Uh, next up, we have Ryo Tokunaga, who is Managing Director, Tokyo Office, Government of British Columbia. Uh, Minister Chow, of course, mentioned in his opening remarks that BC has that trade and investment uh, office and team based in Tokyo. And so we're fortunate to have Rio join us today to tell us a little bit more about the role that they play. So I will turn things over to you, Rio. Yeah, thank you very much, Ben. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Rio Tokunaga, a managing director of the BC office in Tokyo. Um, for me, so I will explain briefly explain about our team here in Tokyo and how we assist uh, stakeholders in the Japanese market. Um, so we're a team of four and we'll be uh, expanding to five in the next month or so. Um, the main uh, sectors that we cover in areas of, in terms of exports from BC to Japan are mainly in energy, mining resources, agri-foods and meat products uh, that pretty much take, uh, take up a large bulk of annual volume from uh, BC to Japan side. Um, and uh, just to mention that for forestry products, uh, BC Wood has a team here in Tokyo promoting wood products um, from BC. Um, so that's you know the resources side. And for the technology sector, such as clean tech, um, AI quantum computing applications, uh, gaming, AR, VR, life sciences uh, that are uh, you know kind of focus areas for BC in Japan. Um, we are actively supporting BC companies in making the first connections with BC companies, uh, conducting follow-ups and uh, entering the market for them to enter the market through partnerships. So, I mean, it, it does like overlap with the work of Trade Commissioner Service, um, but, you know, but the difference uh, in my view is that, you know, Trade TCS focuses a little bit more on like conducting Canada-wide program, um, whereas we are a little bit more hands-on with the BC uh, BC companies. Um, so as an approach, um, if you identify Japan as a focus market and are willing to invest your time and resources, uh, it will be gr a great idea to go through the TCS network, uh, become a TCS client, 
and also you know work with us as well um so you know we look forward to supporting some of you in the audience and with that um i will hand the microphone back to ben thank you Thank you very much, Ryo. Also, I uh, believe he will be with us for the entire webinar. So if there are questions, please do direct them and uh, really appreciate that uh, summary. Um, hopefully we'll, you will hear from attendees, if not today, but uh, coming, you know, as, the, as opportunities arise or they need some assistance in market, that's uh, good to know that you're there. So I'm just going to give a second for my presentation to be loaded and, um, of course, uh, I, my name is Ben Gliznik, and uh, as I introduced uh, myself at the beginning, I, I am with the Trade Policy and Negotiations Branch with uh, the province of BC. And um, our branch is focused on uh, what we represent BC's interest in negotiations, both uh, domestic and international free trade agreement negotiations, uh, as well as trade disputes affecting BC. And uh, that's, of course, in addition to the FTA promotion events uh, like we're doing today. Uh, let's move to the second slide, please. Uh, I know especially Lisa talked a little bit about some of these things already, so I will try not to, to be too repetitive. But um, with the CPTPP, uh, when it was being negotiated, economic modeling showed that BC was going to benefit more under the CPTPP than under the original Trans-Pacific Partnership. And the primary reason for that was the U.S. departure from the original TPP agreement, ensuring that uh, producers and, and, and um, all those in BC and Canada would have a leg up on any U.S. competitors in those markets. Um, and so being on a level playing field with those who already have preferential access in Japan is great. And of course, having an edge on those that don't have that access is also excellent. Um, but it's important to know that that preferential access won't necessarily last forever. Um, the CPTPP is designed for expansion. And so we know that there have already been applications to join as well as uh, several countries that have expressed interest in joining. And that's great too, that the more that the agreement grows, the more that the access to those other markets can grow. But of course, it also means that you may have additional competition in those other markets uh, in the CPTPP area. And so that's one of the main reasons that we're doing sessions like this uh, to, to try to capitalize on the advantage that we have and uh, help you leverage those benefits under the CPTPP. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, we understand that most SMEs like yours don't have a lot of time to be navigating complex free trade agreements. And, you know, the CPTPP is over a thousand pages and it has 30 chapters um, with multiple annexes. They're complex, complex language, very legal. Uh, that's why we're, we're, we're here to, to support you. Um, this agreement co covers traditional areas uh, of that many FTAs do, areas like goods, services, and investment. Um, but it also covers, uh, I guess, less traditional areas of the economic partnership, things like digital trade um, and um, things like inclusive trade. There is a dedicated SME chapter, which is really geared toward uh, encouraging SME participation in, in international trade. And it does things like making government procurement opportunities a little easier to access, uh, or just very simple things like making sure that there are simple and easily accessible websites to, to walk you through how to, to use the agreement. Um, Canada, I mentioned inclusive trade. Canada has really sought to uh, make inclusive trade a priority in its recent FTAs, and BC has uh, shown that it is very supportive of inclusive trade and free trade agreements. This is really about ensuring that the benefits that accrue from trade are felt by as many people as possible, and in particular, underrepresented export groups like women, Indigenous, and youth owned businesses. Uh, let's move to the next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I get the uh, 
I'm fortunate to, to be the one that has to walk through some of the technical details, so I will try not to, to be too technical, but uh, this just shows you uh, a small sample of tariff reductions under the CPTPP for Japan. And of course, tariff reductions and eliminations make your the cost of your product um, more competitive. And once fully implemented, the CPTPP will have 99% of all tariff lines will become duty-free under the agreement. Uh, and so these, what you see here is Japan's tariffs on select products under the CPTPP compared with um, countries that don't have F an FTA with Japan. Uh, and so this is known as the most favored nation rate, the MFN rate. And you can see that in some cases, uh, the, the advantage is quite considerable. If you just sort of scroll through, you can see that there are some tariffs up to 34, 30, 25%. Uh, and without an FTA with Japan uh, versus duty-free with uh, the CPTPP. In some cases, those are already down at zero. And, uh, in, and in others, you can see that there are some tariff phase-outs that are still underway. So um, with Honey, for example, we're sitting at 9.5% this year, and that will be down to zero by uh, 2025. The other thing that you might consider under the CPTPP is imports into British Columbia. And the agreement also reduces tariffs on products coming into Canada. And so you might be able to bring something in from one of the CPTPP partners as an input into a finished product and, and also saving you money. Um, the other thing though that uh, I will mention when it comes to goods is around the agreement's efforts to reduce non-tariff barriers. And these are things that can also cost you even more than tariffs in some cases. And so things like differing standards or duplicative testing, um, unreasonably onerous labeling or certification requirements. Uh, the good thing is that this agreement seeks to tackle these and tries to encourage the use of internationally accepted standards or it creates committees to address these types of barriers. And if you are experiencing these barriers, we would like to know, I think most of us on this most of the speakers that you hear from today, um, either they have a direct role in addressing some of these barriers or they know who to put you in touch with uh, to try to get these addressed. Next slide, please. This is a resource that uh, Lisa had on one of her last slides. Um, I just strongly encourage you to check it out. Uh, I know that the examples, the tariff ex examples that I had on, on my last slide weren't been not necessarily applicable for you. This tool allows you to very easily identify the tariffs that uh, may be applicable for you. All, all you really need to know is the market of interest um, and the good. And, and you can use a keyword or you can use an HS code if you know it. And once you plug that in, it will let you know what the relevant tariff is, whether there's a phase out and by when it will be duty free. Um, the, only, the only caveat here is that this tool is only available for uh, markets where Canada has free trade agreements in place. If, if, that's, if you are looking at a market where there is no FTA, then you might want to look at the WTO tariff lookup tool as an alternative. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Just a few things to, to, to mention uh, if you are looking to export goods under the CPTPP, and this is largely largely applicable across uh, all of, of Canada's FTAs. Um, as I said, first you need to identify your tariff preference. We've already talked about that. Um, the next is to check the rules of origin compliance. Uh, you, you, to be able to take advantage of those preferential rates, you need to demonstrate that you meet the rules of origin. If your good is wholly obtained then in Canada, then you shouldn't have a problem. But if your product contains inputs from outside of Canada or the, or the CPTPP area, then you may need to check to ensure that it does meet those rules. Um, the, the good thing about the, the rules of origin under the CPTPP is that the rule of accumulation applies. So what this means is that if the good is produced in the territory of one or more of the CPTPP partners by one or more producer, uh, producers, um, this still allows you to, to have qualified for those rules of origin and um, can, can hopefully encourage you to more actively participate in the global value chain of the CPTPP region. Uh, the next thing to keep in mind is that the preferential uh, treatment does not automatically get uh, provided to you. You need to 
claim it. And so to claim it, you need a certificate of origin, which in this case can be completed by an exporter uh, or a producer or importer under the CPTPP. It, the certificate doesn't need to follow a prescribed format. It needs to be in writing, um, which can include digitally. And um, it, there are some minimum data requirements. If it is in English, it must be accepted. And I think Lisa mentioned the word overwhelming. I think, you know, I understand that this can seem overwhelming, but the great thing is that uh, you can request something called an advanced ruling. And this really gives certainty uh, around your product, whether or not the customs agency will determine it meets those rules of origin, uh, determine it meets the HS coding for your good that you think it, that it meets. And it gives you this certainty before your product is even shipped so that there are no surprises at the border. Um, this is this request can be made for usually for free or, or relatively low cost, and it is binding on that customs authority. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I'm just going to jump to services quickly. And um, the first thing I'll mention about services under the CPTPP is that the CPTPP uses what is called a negative list approach, which means that all services are covered by the agreement unless a party has taken an exception or reservation against it. And so the first step is just making sure that your service is covered by the agreement. The next is just some of the core obligations that the CPTPP and most other FTAs make around services. The first is that your service uh, as the BC service provider should get no worse treatment than Japan provides services from its other FTA and WTO partners. This is known as most, most favored nation treatment. Uh, the, it should get the same treatment as other domestic service providers. This is national treatment. And parties should not be imposing restrictions on the quantity or types of entities that can be supplying services within Japan. Yeah, service providers also benefit from improved access commitments by Japan in some key sectors. Uh, professional services, for example, legal, engineering, and architectural, uh, transport, research, and development, and uh, environmental services as well. The last thing I'll mention with respect to the obligations is that is local presence. Uh, countries can't be imposing any sorts of local presence requirements um, or residency requirements as a condition of the cross-border supply of the service. Uh, temporary entry is also something you may want to be aware of. It is, uh, makes it easier for you to enter these markets, including Japan as a business visitor, an investor, a uh, highly skilled professional. Canada did gain new access to Japan, uh, which happens to have some fairly liberal act, uh, li sorry, fairly liberal commitments under the CPTPP when it comes to temporary entry. Um, note that this doesn't replace the visa process, but it does make it easier to enter if you fall under those, those categories. Uh, and the last thing is government procurement. This is something that we could probably do an entire session to and talking about all of the opportunities available uh, under the CPTPP or, or, or wherever, but this, you know, businesses can compete uh, for uh, on a more equal basis for domestic uh, with domestic suppliers in Japan, uh, as long as the government is sorry, as long as the procurement is covered uh, as a relevant good or relevant uh, service uh, and is above a set dollar threshold. Next slide, please. This. Uh, is just a similar looking slide, but uh, relevant for investment. And um, I, I think uh, you may have flipped back there. So you could just flip back to investment, at least on my screen. There we go, awesome. These, these really mirror a lot of the concepts that I just went over with respect to services. So national treatment parties will treat each other's invest, investors no worse than their own. Uh, most favored nation, if one of the parties gives an investment from another country, uh, better treatment, they will apply it to Canadians as well. And a minimum, minimum standards of treatment for investors, uh, rules around performance requirements. So parties cannot impose conditions on an investment such as a buy local requirement. Uh, covered investments are protected from expropriation uh, or nationalization, except in specific circumstances and, and uh, uh, definitely must be accompanied with some sort of adequate compensation. Uh, investors can freely transfer uh, capital and profits related to an investment into and out of the host country and temporary 
entry, as I mentioned on the previous slide, also applies for investors under the CPTPP to Japan. And uh, the one thing I will mention there is just that, uh, in, in effect, with some some of the provisions under the CPTPP, uh, Canada has entered into ten different bilateral agreements, um, rather than one consistent multilateral agreement with all of these parties. And so, just because you know that you can enter as an investor under the temporary entry program for Japan, please don't assume that that also applies for, say, uh, New Zealand, for example, because New Zealand may have taken different commitments and it's important to check to make sure that that's uh, also the case for other countries you may be looking to enter. Uh, and that's that's it, that's the last slide. I've uh, spoken too much already. This is my contact information. Uh, if leveraging the CPTPP or, or getting it to Japan is something that you're interested in, please contact me. And um, if I don't have the answer, I will make sure to get you in touch with uh, someone who does. Thank you. And uh, as my presentation is removed, I will introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. A.W. Lee. Uh, A.W. is Senior Program Manager, Diversity and Inclusive Growth Strategy for Women Entrepreneurs with the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. Thank you for joining us today, A.W. I will turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, bonjour. Uh, hi, everyone from BC and in Japan. I, um, I'm just going to pull up my presentation and share a screen. All right, I believe it is up. If, it, if it's not, please let me know. Um, great, great, great. So thanks again, Ben. And uh, I again am A.W. Lee and I support women and gender non-binary entrepreneurs introduce their companies to new markets in the Asia Pacific through dedicated trade missions. And I'm joining you from the traditional territory of the Wendat, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. And I'd like to say that I'm grateful as a racialized migrant settler to be a, a guest among my friends and my neighbors, Kenteke, Kanyin Kahaka, Bay of Quinty Mohawks. And uh, because I am here to highlight opportunities for growing inclusive trade ties between Canada and Japan, um, I'd also like to reflect on uh, the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, one of the several agreements shared between Indigenous nations in the area that I call home, reflecting on the obligation of mutual caring and sharing in abundance with each other, ensuring that that dish that we all share is never left empty. And so in that spirit, like Ben mentioned, the CPTPP advances Canada's inclusive approach to trade with provisions to ensure that the benefits of trade and abundance that is created are more widely shared among uh, underrepresented groups like women and Indigenous people in Canada, such as the First Nations, Métis, Inuit, but also Indigenous people around the globe, including CPTPP countries um, like Japan's uh, Ainu people. So a little bit of background on the foundation. For those of you who are unfamiliar with us, we are a national nonprofit think tank focused on strengthening Canada's relations with Asia. And our mission is to be Canada's catalyst for engagement with the Asia Pacific and the Asia's bridge to Canada. So in that vein, stemming from national focus group research from across Canada, from Vancouver to Halifax, we convened women in business, academia, and government between 2017 and 2019 to discuss broadly the economic barriers to women's advancement. And a key recommendation that we took out from that that, we, that was surfaced was that a women-only and gender-inclusive trade mission to high growth, as well as mature economies in Asia, was necessary to move the dial on inclusion of underrepresented groups in trade. So in 2019, uh, we, APF Canada, delivered the first ever Canada women-only business mission to Japan uh, shortly after the CPTPP entered into force at the end of uh, 2018. And so sponsored by Manuelite Financial, Air Canada, and Jap Japan luxury goods company, Samantha Tabasa, uh, we were also supported by a number of nonprofits, uh, universities from Canada and Japan, as well as the governments in both countries. So we were able to support 17 entrepreneur uh, women on the trade mission that year, uh, and it was designed around 
companies operating in the multi-sector care economy, uh, including companies ranging from healthcare services, fintech companies, pharmaceutical companies, medtech devices, AI, robotics, et cetera. And these were all aimed at the J Japanese market of, like Lisa mentioned, the, the uh, rapidly aging demographic, uh, which continues to create a fantastic opportunity for companies in that space. And so the format of the mission was, uh, and it included several market training opportunities leading up to the conference. Uh, this included officials from the Japanese government who provided insights into the business culture in Japan, as well as support from the Canadian Trade Commissioner Services in Japan, uh, who led site visits to tech innovation centers showcasing Japanese elder care technology. So, for example, here we have one of our delegates uh, trying on a walking assistance robotic device, uh, powered exoskeleton, uh, helping to drive the legs for people with mobility issues like people after uh, having a stroke. Let's see if the video will play. And so at the time, it was a new innovation that just a few weeks prior received FDA approval in the United States, and our delegation got a sneak peek of the device in Japan. In addition to those innovation site visits, uh, we uh, uh, convened a cabinet level discussion on gender inclusion in STEM and business with participation from Canadian and Japanese officials touching on best practices, policy opportunities to advance gender equity and trade. And most importantly of all, we work closely with the Canadian Trade Commissioner Services in Tokyo at the embassy uh, to provide B2B matching services for our delegates. And uh, in the two months subsequent to our mission, out of 17 delegates, eight deals were struck. And this included sales contracts, research and development, distribution deals, but following our delegates in the two years since, major deals have come to fruition with multinational consumer technology labs, uh, phar pharma companies, industrial design partnerships with Japanese car developers for one of our med tech ma manufacturers. And so we had a mix of in, uh, immediate as well as long-term successes coming out of the women's mission. So following our... Oops. Following our delegates in the years since they've also reported other intangible benefits like having that cultural and business training prior to the mission was invaluable for our delegates and uh, we arranged introductions to business culture from former diplomats in Japan and Japan's trade office prior to the delegates even getting to the country and uh, the delegates also reported that participation in the trade mission lent a kind of credibility to their companies in a market in which their companies were relatively unknown. So since relationship building is anywhere, <laughs> domestically or internationally, requires, requires a lot of trust to be built, by joining our mission, they were able to demonstrate a real commitment to the Japanese market by going in person, connecting with important market players and stakeholders. This gives them a certain X factor, boosting credibility and, and market profile. So, but it wasn't just their association with the high profile corporations, but also uh, dignitaries like here are the uh, business mission delegates at a luncheon with Her Imperial Highness Princess Takamoto as part of the official program. Again, lending significant profiles to their companies in a new market. So the networking was uh, by far one of the best outcomes for our for our delegates because in addition to networking with government and industry folk, uh, they were also able to benefit, uh, surprisingly uh, to us at least, by networking with each other. So uh, building camaraderie with a shared objective of supporting women and gender diversity in trade. They were also closely related. Uh, they were also in closely related industries within Canada. So it helped cross pollinate opportunities even after they uh, returned home to Canada from the mission. And finally, also the ongoing support from the Trade Commissioner Service, as well as APF Canada's uh, continued networking opportunities helped the entrepreneurs really follow through with long-term relationship building. So here is 
a picture of our delegates in Ottawa well after the mission uh, with uh, the Honorable Mary Ng, uh, Minister of International Trade, and the then Japanese Prime Minister Abe Shinzo, not pictured, but he was at the luncheon, and this really helped continue this, this commitment to long-term relationship building in Japan. So following the successes of our mission to Japan, we led subsequent missions to South Korea, Taiwan, India, Australia, and New Zealand. And unfortunately, they were a mixture of hybrid and online events. Uh, so the, here's the Korea Trade Office welcoming our, some of our delegates, as well as the Minister of International Trade, uh, to their offices. We had many Zoom meetings, as you all have had in the last couple of years. Um, but here is also in the in the middle, Minister Audrey Tong, uh, Taiwan's first trans woman identified minister responsible for all things digital, welcoming our Canadian entrepreneurs to Taiwan's innovation economy. So despite the format, irrespective of it, uh, we've still supported dozens and dozens of women and gender non-binary entrepreneurs be introduced to over 350 companies and other potential partners in the Asia Pacific. And we are proud to report that even though not all meetings resulted in tangible outcomes, anywhere from a half to two thirds of our delegates, depending on the mission, had follow on negotiations, many of which have led to sales contracts, partnership deals, boots on the ground agents. Um, and due to the need for continuous relationship building, many of these talks are still ongoing. So we really look forward to uh, some, some good outcomes from that. But even if they didn't sign a deal or make a sale, they still walked away with, a pl with plenty of new information about each economy and their potential product market fit, working with the uh, Trade Commissioner Services uh, afterwards. So I am delighted to share with you that at the end of this year, APF Canada, we are returning to Japan to lead the second business mission dedicated to supporting women and gender non-binary entrepreneurs. So even though it's not officially announced yet, I'm able to share with this advanced, um, specially curated audience interested in Japan that our applications are opening soon and that our thematic focus will include clean tech and healthcare technologies. Uh, Lisa mentioned all of the great opportunities uh, in, in clean tech uh, that, are, that are available to, uh, to uh, Canadian companies who support carbon neutrality, clean technologies to reduce emissions and, and uh, the energy transition to renewables, uh, but also, Canadian entrepreneurs who are in the healthcare side, uh, Japan's aging population, uh, like Lisa mentioned, is the world's oldest population. Uh, last year, they estimated 36.4 million people over the age of 65. And with, uh, with an elderly, so as the third largest economy in the world and with a relatively large cohort of middle-class consumers who want to preserve a high quality of life into old age, there is quite a runway for tapping into this expanding market because that age cohort won't peak until it's estimated in the 2040s. So uh, opportunities for medical devices, other elder care solutions, and, and so I look forward to, um, to hearing for any, from any of you uh, who are interested and fit the criteria for our trade mission. Again, our, our applications are opening soon. And so thank you very much. Uh, please get in touch with me if you have any questions. Thanks very much. AW, clearly the, uh, the foundation is doing some excellent work to further inclusive trade. And if uh, any of our attendees today were on the line last week for our Australia and New Zealand event, you will know that uh, AW is very eager to make, make that announcement. And so it's exciting that you are able to, to say that you're returning to Japan and uh, with another mission. That's excellent. Um, I just want to, I'm not sure we've received any questions yet, so I just want to uh, remind everyone to send any questions that you may have through the Q&A as we are starting to get closer to the end of the webinar. Uh, our next speaker is Morgan Brown, who is Account Manager uh, for BC or with BC and Export Development Canada. Thanks for joining us, Morgan. I will turn it over to you so you can let everyone know about what you do uh, and how EDC might be able to assist our attendees. Perfect, thanks so much, Ben. And I'll trust you to let me know if, if you can't see this. 
Um, but yeah, thanks everyone. Good evening uh, from me here in Vancouver or good morning if, if you're in Japan. Um, pleasure to be here and just want to give a quick overview of EDC and, and what we do uh, to help Canadian companies. So um, we are an export credit agency and our mandate is to support and develop Canadian capacity to engage in export trade. Uh, we're, we're dedicated to helping Canadian companies of all sizes succeed on the world stage. Um, so Canada's trade performance has lagged OECD peers and um, myself and I think my colleagues all believe that Canadian prosperity relies on international trade and investment. So that's what we're really trying to do here. Um, we want to help them respond to international business opportunities and um, where we fit in is we, we don't compete with banks or other lenders, but we partner with them to help companies. Uh, we are a crown corporation wholly owned by the government of Canada, and we operate at an arm's length from the government. Um, quick shot here of, of just where our, our offices are um, uh, away from Canada. We do have um, feet in these uh, markets who are working with businesses, who know the, uh, the economies there, and it really just helps with our, our um, expertise in, in providing Canadian companies with the um, information that, that they deserve and, and that they need to, to go abroad. Um, while Japan isn't listed here, we do have a representative, Chia Wan Liu, who's, who's based in Shanghai and, and who covers the, the Japanese market. Uh, a lot of numbers here, but I, I invite you maybe to pick a couple to, to focus on. Uh, for myself, um, I like the one on the top left there, the jobs created in, in 2019 from EDC, um, uh, EDC investments and, and financing that we did. Um, so that just goes to show uh, the mandate that we're trying to follow, which is um, growing the Canadian GDP and, and helping businesses succeed. Also, the second one is the 16.1 billion there that, that, that I want to highlight. Um, we, we don't just help Canadian companies export goods abroad, um, but also we can help them open offices in other countries and, and, and grow themselves there. So um, while we do want Canadian companies to keep them successful at home, we also love to try and find the next international success story. And, and, and help them to, to beat the other competition out there. Uh, so our, our major solutions and where we play is, is broken down into these, these main areas. Uh, we're trying to level the playing field for Canadian companies doing business internationally and equipping them with, with tools that they need to expand and diversify their business. Um, main one is financing. Um, so we, we partner with Canadian banks and, and share risk where they might be unwilling to take it on themselves. A couple different uh, products under there that, that we won't have time to get into. Um, insurance, um, just protecting from non-payment, and, and this can even be used to access more working capital with, with banks if, if uh, you have insured receivables. Uh, knowledge, uh, we provide resources and expertise in expanding internationally and connections. Uh, we can connect Canadian companies with uh, companies abroad who are a good fit for one another and, and can uh, benefit from, from each other's services or, or products. Um, quick here, this just came from our rep in, in Japan there. Um, uh, we, we've shared some other numbers, but this obviously resources by far is, is leading the way here. Um, we'll break it down just on the next slide and then light manufacturing a close second. I also wanna highlight, I guess, the smaller ones where um, we, can, we can still play in these areas. Um, we're not just focuses on, on resources. Uh, it's just that's where the BC economy is, is um, uh, successful in and, and that's where we've seen the business, but there is opportunities for, for other growth and, and I'll touch on that later as well. And forestry leading the way here with agriculture and, and fisheries uh, close. And this is uh, EDC business facilitated in Japan. Uh, 
found a good article on our public website uh, from Matthew Fraser. He, he works with the Trade Commissioner Service and, and lived in Japan for five years. Um, he had key uh, tips for, for doing business in Japan. Um, one of his main points that Lisa and, and AW mentioned as well was the aging population. So uh, some countries are turned off um, with slowing growth, but it is growth nonetheless, and it's a large market to, to try and tackle. Um, Global Affairs Canada is projecting $1.8 billion annual increase to Canadian exports to Japan for the next 20 years. So there is a lot there. Um, the CPTPP, as, as others have mentioned, equals opportunities. The tariff cuts are leveling the playing field. And um, fr from the previous slides where we, we are heavy on the resources, uh, Matthew does see a lot of opportunities in the next 20 or 30 years in aerospace, chemicals and plastics, clean tech, and education. Um, so that's where we think uh, there'll be some opportunities going forward, and, and we're able to help in those, in those areas. And finally, slow and steady wins. Um, so this, this just brought up the Kaizen um, uh, term there. It wasn't mentioned in the article, but it, it just made me think of that. Um, some of you may know it's it's slow and steady, continuous improvement. Um, so there's a lot of good principles in that. I invite you to look it up after to improve your business or your life. And uh, that, that's where he, he felt was a common um, um, uh, way to, to get into the economy there. So lots of personal bonds, develop relationships, and things don't move as quick as, as you might want it. A uh, quick overview of our team. I just wanted to include this because you'll get the presentation after and you'll have our contact information and feel free to reach out to any of us um, if it's a good fit or to me and, and, and we can see how we can help. This one as well, since you'll get the slides, these are all hyperlinks uh, with some great resources that, that we offer on our public website. Um, and I invite you to check those out as well if, if there's anything that can help you there. And that's, that's it for me. I, I just wanted to reiterate our mandate. Um, we we want to help can, uh, Canadian companies grow, go, and succeed internationally. And we're here to help you. So please uh, don't, don't hesitate to reach out to myself or my colleagues. Thanks, Ben. Thanks so much, Morgan. We will include Morgan's contact details in our follow-up email. So anyone who's interested can follow up with him. For the last part of our webinar, we wanted to bring you some information directly from someone operating in Japan. Uh, and to that end, uh, we have a couple of speakers. I'm not sure if uh, if Jennifer, I see Jennifer is still on the line, but I know that she may be in the process of catching a ferry. Um, Jennifer, I just wanna check to see if you're available. Okay, Jennifer, uh, we've, Jennifer, uh, who I will introduce in a second, um, I'm also going to introduce Akiko Kurose with Crap Japan. She is uh, she has joined us as well, and hopefully she's still connected. Um, we are uh, Crap is BC Blueberries Council's uh, market coordinator for BC Blueberries in Japan, and uh, some of the information that uh, Akiko has to say may not align um, with your you know your experience or some of your goals. But um, you know, given the focus on blueberries, but hopefully there's something that uh, you can take from the presentation, uh, and you know, general market information or experiences or whatever it may be that uh, she can share. Thank you for being here, Akiko. We're really interested to learn about uh, the Japanese market. What's it like operating in the ground there? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So I will share. Uh, my screen here. Okay. Okay, so is my sh screen okay? <laughs> yes, it looks good to me. Okay, thank you. 
Um, so my name is, thank you for the introduction. My name is Akiko Kurose of uh, Prep Japan. Uh, Prep Japan Group has been the partner agency for the BC Blueberry Council in Japan since uh, 2019. Um, it's an honor to represent the BC Blueberry Council and a pleasure to have this opportunity. So today I will present to you Uh, the market landscape and opportunities for BC blueberries, uh, BC businesses in Japan, and some examples of successful activities that the BC Blueberry Council has executed in Japan. As we are in the agri food business, uh, most of this information will be for agri food or consumer products, but I hope there's something that you can take away from this presentation. So, uh, Japan is uh, only about one third of size compared to BC, but as you know well, we are just next to Canada and neighbors across the Pacific. Um, Climate-wise, Japan has just entered the rainy season, which will last about a month. It's hot and humid in the summer and cold and dry in the winter. So uh, to give you an idea of the market size for uh, agri-food, food products, um, here are some figures of the number of outlets in Japan, over 17,000 supermarkets, over 2,500 mid to large scales, uh, what we call general merchandising stores or shopping centers, uh, nearly 57,000 convenience stores, which uh, in like central Tokyo, you can find on every block or, or corner of, the of town. Uh, and 540,000 food services, which are restaurants and cafes. And this uh, count uh, does not include like nightclubs and uh, such uh, food services. Of course, there are a lot of competitors, both domestic and international, but these would be potential outlets to uh, showcase uh, BC agri-food products. So for the Japanese, there's a, this is a real national issue, but uh, Japan has a low food uh, self-sufficiency ratio. Canada, as you can see on the far left, is completely self-sufficient, which is such an impressive figure uh, uh, compared to us on the far right. Uh, Calorie-based, we are under 40% uh, self-sufficiency. And uh, although for some items such as rice, which we have 100%, uh, vegetables and others have a higher ratio than uh, 40, uh, Japan's food supply relies on imports. So uh, during this webinar, um, I was listening to what Lisa and AW and also Morgan was mentioning that uh, some of our national is for some of our national issues, Canada can really help us and it is, 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 uh, it's, it's really great to have a, 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 a friend to be able to help in these for, for our issues such as food supply, also energy and also our aging population. Uh, Japanese consumers are highly price sensitive, uh, especially with the recent inflation situation, but we also love gourmet and high quality food. Uh, you may know all, uh, some of our fruits and seafood that are like perfectly displayed in, in boxes for gifting and so on. According to a consumer survey, 45.2% answered that they're willing to purchase a premium consumer product if the taste quality or health benefit is satisfying. So a lot of BC products have great quality. Therefore, if promoted properly, we believe that there could be many opportunities in the Japanese market. And of course, the CPTPP is a great opportunity. Since it became effective, we communicated to trade and media that tariff has been eliminated for uh, blueberries. Another advantage uh, of this is that the respective governments are promoting this partnership and companies, industries, and media in Japan put importance in following policies promoted by the Japanese uh, government. And the CPTPP has been one of the reasons that for importers to consider uh, to switch uh, to Canada from other countries. 
And next, I would like to introduce to you some of the activities we have executed to raise recognition and promote BC blueberries in Japan. Uh, communication and education in the local language is highly important as uh, English proficiency in Japan is quite low, even among corporate executives. So we have a local website and we issue press releases regularly to communicate and educate the Japanese audience about BC, Canada, BC blueberries and its products. We have also uh, developed recipes with Japanese food specialists and chefs as the preferences and portions differ a bit from Canada. And we also exhibit in trade shows every year to raise recognition among trade, food services, and retailers. Uh, BC blueberries are sampled and we also always get really positive comments about the great taste and quality of the berries. Um, this may be a surprising to hear, but very few Japanese are aware that Canada or BC is a major blue blueberry production area. So we start by explaining this and also explain the location of British Columbia. Uh, and uh, compared to 2019 when we started, we believe that more people recognize Canada and BC for its fantastic blueberries. We also have executed promotions with cooking platforms that have influence on trade and consumers and also some social media campaigns. Uh, with these promotional activities initiated by the BC Blueberry Council and all the tremendous efforts of BC Blueberry packers and producers, uh, also the support of British Columbia and Canada, Canadian governments and also of course its offices in Japan, uh, Canadian blueberries currently have the top share of frozen blueberries impo imported in Japan. So uh, I hope this presentation has helped to give you a slight idea of actual business in Japan. Uh, Prep Japan is one of the top five PR communication agencies in Japan and with 50 years of history, we also have supported foreign businesses or organizations seeking to enter or grow their businesses in Japan. Um, if, you can if you have any questions about this presentation or interest in our services, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I would be happy to help. Uh, thank you and uh, back to you, Ben. Thank you, Akiko. I think we that had definitely had some broad applicability for, you know, at the very least, some other agri-food producers and hopefully others as well. Um, we have some more, uh, just a few more minutes. So I just wanted to check in quickly with Jennifer again to see if she's still connected. And uh, I don't wanna put Jennifer on the spot because I only spoke with her earlier today, but Jennifer is, uh, um, she is the CEO and founder of ULAT Dryer Balls. And I just wanted to give her an opportunity to, uh, to speak a little bit about her own experience with respect to Japan and um, Jennifer, I'm not sure how your connection is, but um, please, please maybe please connect and see if we can we can hear you. Hello, Ben. Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes, very well. Thank you. Excellent. Well, greetings from BC Ferries, uh, <laughs> currently floating in the Salish Sea here on the west coast of British Columbia. So sorry for the interior of my U-Haul as I actually prepare for my export of product to Japan. So the timing could not be more perfect. This is great. Um, and it's lovely to see so many familiar faces. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how much time I have, but I, I'm really glad that Ben reached out and wanted to get my, or for me to give my perspective on the experience. And I think many of the points were wonderful in each presentation, all very diverse, very informative. Um, but I think slow, steady, um, guided, collaborative, Think of ecosystems and patience um, is all what is needed to really find uh, your footing in Japan. And it's great to know that you have many partners um, who are there to support you as I've had in, in our experiences and continue to. Um, but I would also encourage those who are in the clean tech sector for consumer products uh, with the um, global warming happening. It's actually helped boost the popularity of my product uh, as the rainier seasons are longer, uh, Japan is having to embrace 
the life of a dryer and their laundry uh, tasks. And that's where my product comes in to help meet United Nations sustainability goals, as well as uh, to help families um, help assist their, their pocketbook uh, when trying to live healthy, happy homes with their family and friends in their community. So just to think a bit beyond the box, but really be prepared to be nimble, patient, um, and, and great to have a team like, like these people on board today's, uh, today's panelists and, and information providers, um, but also on a broader scale. Um, there's a lot of people during my time at the G20YEA um, as a, a, a partner delegate in 2019, it was wonderful to spend a week uh, with the representatives of the Trade Commission Office um, of the Canadian Embassy in Tokyo in Fukuoka, Japan, and really learning the ins and outs and meeting with some really spectacular uh, knowledgeable, caring folk who really want to nurture and make our relationships between our two countries so much stronger and more meaningful um, than I, I actually anticipated. So if I can be of any assistance and, and answer any questions, I'm happy to share my, my email to, to those who are listening. And um, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak um, on the wild ride of exporting dryer balls um, to Japan. I hope this helps, Ben. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Jennifer. I appreciate that. We will definitely include Jennifer's contact information in the resources that go out and um, appreciate you connecting from the ferry. That's great. Um, we, we are running near the, the end of our, our webinar today. So I just, I, I know, I can't believe it, but we somehow got through, uh, there, there was a question in the, in the, uh, the Q&A and it looks like somebody, one of our speakers has, um, noted that they were going to follow up. Uh, this is a question specific to um, Indigenous trade missions. And I, I think Eric is going to follow up and I'll provide something as well from the provincial government side that will hopefully be of use. Um, but if there are other questions, of course, follow up with uh, any one of the speakers individually uh, after the session. And um, that's all we have for, for today's webinar. As you can see, there are layers, so to speak, of trade supports and other types of supports available to you all. Um, most of it is free as you, and as you navigate you know, exporting and entering the Japanese market, I hope you can, you can leverage that. Um, if you don't know where to start, please just reach out to me and I promise to get you in touch with uh, someone who can help. Um, this really is a, a collaborative effort and we are here to help you. Um, please keep your eyes open for that follow-up email I mentioned. And uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, special thanks to Minister Chow and, and all of our speakers for your contributions. I hope to hear from all of you very soon. Thank you. <laughs>